Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. My name is Dr. Ayaz Afsa, and our topic today is historical and documentary research. Maulin 1978 states that while historical research cannot meet some of the tests of the scientific method interpreted in the specific sense of its use in the physical sciences, it qualifies as a scientific endeavor from the standpoint of its subscription to the same principles and the same general scholarship that characterize all scientific research. Historical research has been defined as the systematic and objective location, evaluation and synthesis of evidence in order to establish facts and draw conclusions about past events. It is an act of reconstru reconstruction undertaken in a spirit of critical inquiry designed to achieve a faithful representation of a previous age. In seeking data from the personal experiences and observations of others, from documents and records, researchers often have to contend with inadequate information so that their reconstructions tend to be sketches rather than portraits. The difficulty of obtaining adequate data makes historical research one of the most taxing kinds of inquiry to conduct satisfactorily. Reconstruction implies reconstruction, reconstruction implies an historic perspective in that the method of inquiry characterize, characterizing historical research attempts to encompass and then explain the whole realm of man's past in a perspective that greatly accepts uh, his social, cultural, economic, and intellectual development. Ultimately, historical research is concerned with a broad view of the conditions and not necessarily the specifics which bring them about. Although such a synthesis is rarely achieved without intense debate or controversy, especially on matters of detail. The act of historical research involves the identification and limitation of a problem or an area of study. Sometimes the formulation of an hypothesis, the collection, organization, verification, validation, analysis, and selection of data. Testing the hypothesis where appropriate and writing a research report. This sequence leads to a new understanding of the past and its relevance to the present and future. The values of historical research have been categorized by Hill and Kaba as follows. It enables solutions to contemporary problems to be sought in the past. It throws light on present and future trends. It stresses the relative importance and the effects of the various interactions that are to be found within all cultures. It allows for the evaluation of data in relation to selected hypotheses, theories, and generalizations that are presently held about the past. As the writers uh, on historical research point out, the ability of the ability of history to employ the past to predict the future and to use the present to explain the past gives it a dual and unique quality which makes it especially useful for all sorts of scholarly study and research. The particular value of historical research in the field of education is unquestioned. Although one of the most difficult areas in which to undertake research, the outcomes of inquiry into this domain can bring 
great benefit uh, to educationists, educationalists, and the community at large. It can, for example, yield insights into some educational problems that could not be achieved by any other means. Furthermore, the historical study of an educational idea or institution can do much to help us understand how our present educational system has come about. And this kind of understanding can in turn help to establish a sound basis for further progress of change. Historical research in education can also show how and why educational theories and practices develop. It enables educationalists to use former practices to evaluate newer emerging ones. Recurring trends can be more easily identified and assessed from a historical standpoint. Witness, for example, the, the various guises in which progressivism in education has appeared. And it can contribute to a fuller understanding of the relationship between politics and education, between school and society, between local and central government, and between teacher and pupil. Historical research in education may concern itself with an individual, a group, a movement, an idea, or an institution. As Bess points out, not one of these objects of historical interest and observation can be considered in isolation. No one person can be subjected to historical investigation without some consideration of his or her contribution to the ideas, movements, or institutions of a particular time or place. These elements are always interrelated. The focus merely determines the point of emphasis towards which historical researchers direct their attention. No matter whether the historical no matter whether the historian chooses to study the Jesuit order, religious teaching orders, the counter reformation or Ignatius Loyola, each of the other elements appear as a prominent influence or result and an indispensable part of the narrative. Some of the historical interrelations between men, movements and institutions uh, can be summarized in, in this uh, slide. So men like Ignatius Loyola, Benjamin Franklin and John Dewey and movements could be counter-reformation, scientific movement, education for life, experimentalism and progressive education, these movements in history. Institutions type like religious teaching order, academy, experimental school. And so specific would be Society of Jesus uh, established in 1534, uh, Philadelphia Academy 1751, University of Chicago uh, Elementary School uh, 1896. As with other methods, we consider in this module, historical research may be structured by a flexible sequence of stages, beginning with the selection and evaluation of a problem or area of study. Then follows the definition of the problem in more precise terms, the selection of suitable sources of data, uh, data collection, classification, and processing of the data, and finally, the evaluation and synthesis of the data into a balanced and objective account of the subject under investigation. There are, however, some important differences between the method of historical research and other research methods used in education. The principal difference has been highlighted by Bogue in his work 1963, who suggests that in historical research, it is important for the student to define carefully the problem and appraise its appropriateness before moving into earnest into the project. As many prob problems 
may not be suitable for historical research methods, while on the other hand, other problems may have little or no chance of yielding any significant results either because of the death of relevant data or because the problem is trivial. One can see from Borg's uh, observation that the choice of a problem can sometimes be a daunting business for the potential researcher. Once a topic has been selected, however, and uh, its potential and significance for historical research evaluated, the next stage is to define it more precisely or perhaps more pertinently, delimit it so that a more potent analysis will result. Too broad or too vague a statement can result in the final report lacking direction or impact. Best expresses it like this. The experienced historian realizes that research must be a penetrating analysis of a limited problem rather than the superficial examination of a broad area. The weapon of research is the rifle, not the shotgun. Various prescriptions exist for helping to define historical topics. For example, Gott, uh, Gottschalk uh, 51, 1951 recommends that four questions should be asked, should be asked in identifying a topic and they are number one, where do the events take place? Who are the people involved? When do the events occur? What kinds of human activity are involved? As Travers suggests, the scope of a topic can be modified by adjusting the focus of any one of the four categories. The geographical area involved can be increased or decreased. More or fewer people can be included in the topic. The time span involved can be increased or decreased. And the human activity category can be uh, broadened or narrowed. Uh, it sometimes happens that a piece of historical research can only begin with a rough idea of what the topic involves and that delimitation of it can take place only after the pertinent material has been assembled. Uh, in hand with a careful specification of the problem goes the need where this is appropriate for an equally specific and testable hypothesis. Sometimes a sequence of questions may be uh, substituted. As in uh, empirical research, the hypothesis given direction and focus to data collection and analysis in historical research. Overcoming the risk of aimless and uh, simple accretion of facts, that is a hypothesis informs the search for and selection of data, a particular problem if many data exist in the field. It imposes a selection a structure on what would otherwise be an overwhelming mass of information. Borg 1963 observed that this requires the careful focusing, delimiting and operationalization of the hypothesis. Hill and Kaba 1967 have pointed out that the evaluation and formulation of problem associated with historical research after involved the personality of the researcher to a greater extent than do other basic types of research. They suggest that personal factors of investigator such as interest, motivation, historical curiosity and educational background for the interpretation of historical facts tend to influence the selection of the problem to a great extent. Uh, data collection in historical research. One of the principal differences between historical research and other forms of research is that historical research must deal with data 
that already exist. Hawkins argues that as history is not a science which uses direct observation as in chemistry or biology, the historian like the archaeologist has to interpret past events by the traces which have been left. Of course, the historian has to base judgments on evidence weighing, evaluating and judging the truth of the evidence of others' observations until the hypothesis explains all the relevant evidence. Sources of data in historical research may be classified into two main groups. Primary sources, which are the lifeblood of historical research, and secondary sources, which may be used in the absence of or to supplement primary data. Primary sources of data have been described as those items that are original to the problem under study and may be thought of as being in two categories. First, the remains are relics of a given period. Although such remains and artifacts as skeletons, fossils, weapons, tools, utensils, buildings, pictures, furniture, coins, and objects that were not meant to trans transmit information to subsequent eras. Nevertheless, they may be useful sources providing sound evidence about the past. Second, those items that have had a direct physical relationship with the events being reconstructed. This category would include not only the written and oral testimony provided by actual participants in or witnesses of an event, but also the participants themselves. Documents considered as primary sources include manuscripts, charters, laws, archives of official minutes, or records, files, letters, memoranda, memoirs, biography, official publications, wills, newspapers and magazines, maps, diagrams, catalogues, films, paintings, inscriptions, recordings, transcriptions, logbooks, research reports. All these are intentionally or unintentionally capable of transmitting a first-hand account of an event and are therefore considered as sources of primary data. Historical research in education draws chiefly on the kind of sources identified in this second category. Secondary sources are those that do not bear a direct physical relationship to the event being studied. They are made up of data that cannot be described as original. A secondary source would thus be one in which the person describing the event was not actually present but who obtained descriptions from another person or source. These may or may not have been primary sources. Other instances of secondary sources used in historical research include quoted material, textbooks, encyclopedias, other reproductions of material or information, prints of paintings, or replicas of art objects. Best uh, 1970 points out that secondary sources of data are usually of limited worth because of the errors that result when information is passed uh, pass on from one person to another. Various commentators stress the importance of using primary sources of data where possible. The value too of secondary sources should not be minimized. There are numerous occasions where a secondary source can contribute significantly to more valid and reliable historical research than would otherwise be the case. 
One further point, the review of the literature in other forms of educational research is regarded as a preparatory stage to gathering data and serves to acquaint researchers with previous research on the topics they are studying. It thus enables them to continue in a tradition, to place their work in context and to learn from earlier endeavors. The function of the review of the literature in historical research, however, is different in that it provides the data for research. The researchers' acceptance or otherwise of their hypothesis will depend on their, se uh, their selection of information from the review and the interpretation they put on it. Book 1963 has identified other differences. One is that the historical researcher will have to peruse longer documents than the empirical researcher who normally studies articles very much more succinct and precise. Further, documents required in historical research often date back much further than those in empirical research. And one final point, documents in education often consist of unpublished material and are therefore less accept accessible than reports of empirical studies in professional journals. For a detailed consideration of the specific problems of documentary research, uh, see the articles by Platt, P L A T, -T 1981, where she considers those of authenticity, availability of documents, sampling problems, inference, and interpretation. Evaluation in uh, uh, historical research. Because workers in the field of historical research gather much of their data and information from records and documents, these must be carefully evaluated so as to attest their worth for the purposes of uh, the particular study. Evaluation of historical data and information is often referred to as historical criticism and the reliable data yielded by the process are known as historical evidence. Historical evidence has thus been described as that body of validated facts and information which can be accepted as trustworthy as a valid basis for the testing and interpretation of hypotheses. Historical criticism is usually undertaken in two stages. First, the authenticity of the source is appraised, and second, the accuracy or worth of the data is evaluated. The two processes are known as external and internal criticism, respectively, and since they each present problems of evaluation, they merit further inspection. First, external criticism. External criticism is concerned with establishing the authenticity or genuineness of data. It is therefore aimed at the document or other source. Uh, it aimed at the document itself rather than the statements it contains with analytic forms of the data rather than the interpretation or meaning of them in relation to the study. He therefore sets out to uncover frauds, forgeries, hoaxes, inventions, or distortions. To this end, the task of establishing the age or authorship of a document may involve tests of factors such as signatures, handwriting, script, type, style, spelling, and place names. Further, was the knowledge it purports to uh, transmit available at the time and uh, is it consistent with what is known about the author or period from another source. Increasingly sophisticated analysis of physical factors can also 
uh, yield clause establishing authenticity or otherwise physical and uh, chemical tests of ink paper parchment cloth and other materials for example investigations in the field of educational history are less likely to encounter deliberate forgeries than in say political or social history though it is possible to find that official documents correspondence and autobiography autobiographies have been ghosted that is prepared by a person other than the alleged author or singer now move on to the other type of criticism uh, I just mentioned is internal criticism having established the authenticity of the document the researchers next task is to evaluate the accuracy and worth of the data contained therein well while they may be genuine the documents may be genuine they may not necessarily disclose the most faithful picture in their concern to establish the meaning and reliability of data investigators are confronted with a more difficult problem than external criticism because they have to establish the credibility of the author of the documents Travers has listed those characteristics commonly considered in making evaluations of writers they are the following where they trained are untrained observers of the events it's about evaluation of the writers where they trained are untrained observers of the events in other words how competent were they what were their relationships to the events to what extent were they under pressure from fear of vanity say to distort, distort or omit facts. What were the intents of the writer of the documents? To what extent were they experts at recording those particular events? Were the habits of the authors such that they might interfere with the accuracy of recordings? Were they too antagonistic are too sympathetic to give true pictures how long after the event did they record their uh, testimonies and were they able to remember accurately and finally are they in agreement with other independent witnesses many documents in the history of education tend to be neutral in character now it is possible that some may be in error because of these kinds of observer characteristics. A particular problem arising from the question posed by Travers is that of bias. This can be particularly acute where life histories are being studied. The chief concern here, as Plummer reminds, resides in examining possible sources of bias which prevent researchers from finding out what is wanted and using techniques to minimize the possible sources of bias. Researchers generally recognize three sources of bias, those arising from the subject being interviewed, those arising from themselves as researchers, and those arising from the subject researcher interaction next is uh, the writing the research report in an historical research once the data have been gathered and subjected to external criticism for authenticity and to internal criti criticism for accuracy the researcher is next confronted with the task of piecing together an account of the events embraced by the research problem this stage is known as the process of synthesis. It is probably the most difficult phase in the project and calls for considerable imagination and resourcefulness 
the resulting pattern is then applied to the testing of the hypothesis. The writing of the final report is equally demanding and calls for creativity and high standards of objective systematic analysis. Best has listed the kinds of problems occurring in the various types of historical research projects submitted by students. These include defining the problem too broadly, the tendency to use easy to find secondary sources of data rather than sufficient primary sources which are harder to locate but usually more trustworthy, inadequate historical criticism of data due to failure to establish authenticity of sources and trustworthiness of data. For example, there is often a tendency to accept a statement as necessarily true when several observers agree. It is possible that one may have influenced the others or that all were influenced by the same inaccurate source of information. Next is poor logical analysis resulting from oversimplification, failure to recognize the fact that causes of events are more often multiple and complex than single and simple. Overgeneralization on the basis of insufficient evidence and false reasoning by analogy basing conclusions upon superficial similarities of situations, failure to interpret wills and expressions in the light of their accepted meaning in an earlier period, failure to distinguish between significant facts in a situation and those that are irrelevant or unimportant. Expression of personal bias as revealed by statements lifted out of context for purposes of persuasion, assuming too generous or uncritical an attitude towards a person or idea, or being too unfriendly or critical. Excessive admiration for the past, or an equally unrealistic admiration for the new or contemporary assuming that all change represents progress. Poor reporting in a style that is dull and colorless, too flowery or flippant, too persuasive or of the soapbox type are lacking in proper usage. Bogengold 1979 suggests several mistakes that can be made in conducting historical research. For example, selecting a topic for which historical sources are slight, inaccessible, or non-existent being over-reliant on secondary sources. Number two, failing to subject the historical sources to internal or external validity or criticism checks. Number three, lacking reflexivity and the researcher's selectivity and bias in using sources. Number four, important concepts from other disciplines. M number five, making illegitimate references of causality and monocausality. And number six, generalizing beyond accept, acceptable limits of the data. And number seven, listing facts without appropriate thematization. In addition to these, Sutherland has brilliantly illustrated two further common errors among historians of education. These are first, projecting current battles back, backwards onto an historical background which leads to distortion and second description in a vacuum which fails to illustrate the relationship of the educational system to the structure of society. 
Mauli, 1978, itemizes five basic criteria for evaluating historical research. Number one is problem. Has the problem been clearly defined? It is difficult enough to conduct historical research adequately without adding to the confusion by starting out with a nebulous problem. Is the problem capable of solution? Is it within the competence of the investigator? And number two, data. Are data of a primary nature available in sufficient completeness to provide a solution? Or has there been an over-dependence on secondary or unverifiable sources? And number three, analysis. Has the dependability of the data been adequately established? Has the relevance of the data been adequately explored? And number four, interpretation. Does the author display adequate mastery of his data and insight into the relative significance? Does the display adequate historical perspective does he display adequate historical perspective? Does he maintain his objectivity or does he allow personal bias to distort the evidence? Are his hypotheses plausible? Have they been adequately tested? Does he take a sufficiently broad view of the total situation? Does he see the relationship between his data and other historical facts. And next is presentation. Does the style of writing attract as well as inform? Does the report make a contribution on the basis of newly discovered data or newly interpretation or new interpretation or is it simply uninspired hack work? Does it reflect scholarship and scholarliness. Then comes the next aspect of historical research, that is the use of quantitative methods in historical research. By far the greater part of research in historical studies is qualitative in nature. This is so because the proper subject matter of historical research consists to a great extent of verbal and other symbolic, symbolic material emanating from a society's or a culture's past. The basic skills required of the researcher to analyze this kind of qualitative or symbolic material involve collecting, classifying, ordering, synthesizing, evaluating and interpreting. At the basis of all these acts lies sound personal judgment. In the comparatively recent past, however, attempts have been made to apply the quantitative methods of the socialist, uh, sorry, um, uh, the, the quantitative methods of the scientists to the solution of historical problems. And they have been recorded by Travers in 1969. Of these methods, the one having greatest relevance to historical research is that of content analysis, the basic goal of which is to take a verbal, non-quantitative document and transform it into quantitative, quantitative data. Content analysis itself has been defined as a multi-purpose research method developed specifically for investigating a broad spectrum of problems in which the content of communication serves as a basis of inference from word counts to categorization. Approaches to content analysis are careful to identify appropriate categories and units of analysis, both of which will reflect the nature of the document being analyzed and the purpose of the research. Categories are normally determined 
after initial inspection of the document and will cover the main areas of content. How the technique of content analysis may be applied to selected aspects of historical research in education? Well, it could be used, for instance, in the analysis of educational documents, in addition to elucidating the content of the document, the method may throw additional light on the source of the communication, its author, and on its intended recipients, those to whom the message is directed. Further, an analysis of this kind would tell us more about the social context and the kinds of factors stressed or ignored and of the influence of political factors, for instance. It follows from this that content analysis may form the basis of comparative or cross-cultural studies. Another usage that comes readily to mind would be an examination of the content of textbooks at different points in recent history as a means of indicating, say, cultural differences, cultural censorship, or cultural change. The purposes of content analysis have been identified uh, in Holstein, 1968. What are they? To describe trends in communication content, to relate known characteristics of sources to messages they produce, to audit communication content against standards, to analyze techniques of persuasion, to analyze style, to relate known attributes of the audience to messages produced for them, to describe patterns of communication. A further example of content analysis in historical settings is Mac Cleland, 1953, study of the relationship between the need to achieve nah for short among members of a society and the economic growth of a particular society in question. Finally, for a more detailed and technical consideration of the use of quantitative methods in historical research, a study which looks at the classifying and arranging of historical data and reviews basic descriptive statistics is flowed in uh, 1979. Now, the next topic on the life histories and historical research. The life history, according to Plummer, is frequently a full-length book about one person's life in his or her own words. Often, Plummer observes, it is gathered over a number of years, the researcher providing gentle guidance to the subject, encouraging him or her either to write down episodes of life or to tape record them. And often as not, these materials will be backed up with intensive observations of the subject's life, with interviews of the subject's friends and acquaintances and with close scrutiny of relevant documents such as letters, diaries, and photographs. Essentially, the life history is an interactive and cooperative technique directly involving the researcher. Accounts of the perspectives and interpretations of people in a variety of educational settings are both significant and pertinent, for they provide valuable insights into the ways in which educational personnel, personnel come to terms with the constraints and conditions in which they work. Life histories, Goodson argues, have the potential to make a far-reaching contribution to the problem. the problem of understanding the links between personal troubles and public issues are tasks 
that lies at the very heart of the sociological enterprise. Their importance, I mean the life history's importance, he asserts, is best confirmed by the fact that teachers continually, most often unsolicited, import life history data into their accounts of classroom events. Miller demonstrates that biographical research is a distinctive way of conceptual conceptualizing social activity. He provides outlines of the three main approaches to analysis, that is to say the realist approach focusing upon grounded theory techniques. The new positivistic approach employing more structural interviews and the narrative approach using the interplay between interviewer and interviewee to actively construct life histories. Well, Denzin, uh, Denzin 1999 suggests that there are several varieties of biographical research methods including biography, autobiography, story, discourse, narrative writing, personal history, oral history, case history, life history, personal experience, case study. This is addressed further by uh, Connelly and Clendinin, uh, who indicate several approaches to narrative inquiry, and they are oral history, stories, annals and chronicles, photographs, um, memory boxes, interviews, journals, autobiography, letters, conversations, documents. In exploring the appropriateness of life history techniques to a particular research project and with ever-present constraints of time, facilities and finance in mind, it is useful to distinguish life histories both by type and mode of presentation, both factors bearing directly upon the scope and feasibility of the research endeavor. The following figure draws on an outline by Hitchcock and Hughes. So there are the types, uh, retrospective life history, contemporane contemporaneous life history, modes of presentation, uh, thematically edited, and interpreted and edited. So uh, re readers may wish to refer to the description of types and modes presented in the above box in assessing the uh, differing demands that are made on intending researchers as they gather, analyze, and present their data. Whether retrospective or contemporaneous, a life history involves five broad research processes, and these have been identified and described by Plummer in 1983. So what's the preparation? This involves the researcher both in selecting an appropriate problem and devising relevant research techniques. Questions to be asked at this stage are first, who is to be the object of the study? The great person, the common person, the volunteer, the selected, the coerced. Second, what makes a good inform informant? Plumber draws attention to key factors such as accessibility of place and availability of time and the awareness of a potential informant of his or her particular cultural milieu. A good informant is able and willing to establish and maintain a close, intimate relationship with the researcher. It is axiomatic that common sympathies and mutual respect are prerequisites for the sustenance and success of a life history project. Third, what needs clarifying in the early stages of the research? The motivations of the researcher need to be made explicit to the intended subject. So too, the question of remuneration for the subject's services should be clarified from the 
outset. The issue of anonymity must also be addressed. For unlike other research methodologies, life histories reveal intimate details, names, places, events, and provide scant cover from prying eyes. The earlier stages of the project also provide opportunities for discussing with the research subject the precise nature of the life history study, the logistics of interview situations, and modes of data, data recording. Data collection and uh, historical research. Central to the success of a life history is the researcher's ability to use a variety of interview techniques. As the occasion demands, these may range from relatively structured interviews that serve as general guides from the outset of the study to informal, unstructured interviews reminiscent of non-directive counseling approaches exposed by Carl, Carl Roger, Rogers, Carl Rogers, 1945, and his followers. In the case of the latter, Plummer draws attention to the importance of empathy and non-possessive warmth on the part of the interview researcher. A third interviewing strategy involves a judicious mixture of participant observation and casual chatting supplemented by note-taking. Typically, life histories generate enormous amounts of data. Intending researchers must take every decision about the use of tape recordings, the how, what, and when of their transcription and editing, and the development of coding and filing devices if they are to avoid being totally swamped by the materials created. Three central issues underpin the quality of data generated by life history methodology. They are to do with representativeness, reliability, and validity. Plummer, 83, draws attention to a frequent criticism of life history research, namely that its cases are atypical rather than representative. To, to avoid this charge, he urges intending researchers to work out and explicitly state the life history's relationship to a wider population. Plummer 1983 by way of appraising the subject on a continuum of representativeness and non-representativeness. Re reliability in life history research hinges upon the identification of sources of bias and the application of techniques to reduce them. Bias arises from the informant, the researcher, and the interactional encounter itself. Several validity uh, checks are available to attending uh, to intending researchers uh, identified by Plummer 83. Uh, they are following the subject of the life history may present an autocritic of it, having read the entire uh, product. A comparison may be made with similar written sources by way of identifying points of major divergence or similarity. A comparison may be made with official records by way of imposing accuracy checks on the life history. A comparison may be made by interviewing uh, other informants. Essentially, the validity of uh, any life history lies in its ability to represent the informant's subjective reality. That is to say, his or her definition of situation. Detailed personal accounts and life histories can be interrogated thematically. Indeed, the use of biographies, autobiographies, fictional accounts, or newspaper journalism raises the question of what counts as legitimate research data. Perhaps such accounts may be better used to provide 
sensitizing concepts and context rather than as mainstream research data. Plumber provides three points of direction for the researcher intent upon writing a life history. First, have a clear view of who you are writing for and what you wish to accomplish by writing the account. Are you aiming to produce a case history or a case study? Case histories tell a good story for its own sake. Case studies by contrast use personal documents for wider theoretical purposes such as the verification and or the generation of theory. Second, having established the purpose of the life history, decide how far you should um, intrude upon your assembled data. Intrusion occurs both through editing and interpreting. Editing, cutting, sequencing, disguising names, places, etc., etc., is almost a sine qua non of any life history study. Editing involves getting your subjects on wheels, grasping them from the inside, and turning them into a structured and coherent statement that uses the subjects' words and places and your own as researcher. Third, as far as the mechanics of writing a life history are concerned, practice writing regularly. Writing plumber observes needs working at and daily drafting, revising, and redrafting, redrafting is necessary. For an example of life history methodology and research, uh, see Evets 1991. There are copious documentary sources of data in research, and although there are ha these are helpful for the researcher, a range of considerations has to be brought to bear on their use. For example, some social worlds, cultures, and events are literate, that is, documents are plentiful and are part of the everyday world of the participants while other cultures may be less so. This affects the status of the documents. Further, while some documents may have been written deliberately for research, most have not. Some are written by researchers for researchers, but again, most are not. Indeed, most have been written for a purpose, agenda, an audience other than researchers, and this raises questions about their reliability and validity. Documents are useful in rendering more visible the phenomena under study. However, they have to take they have to be taken in conjunction with a whole range of other factors occurring at the same time. Prior cites the analogy of the inert opera liberato, which cannot be read on its own but has to be understood in the context of the whole action, drama, music, performance of the opera. It is only one part of the jigsaw. Uh, there are some uh, written uh, sources of uh, data. Some social worlds, cultures, and events are literate. Uh, I have uh, put more slides about uh, documentary re research. Uh, documents take a multiple multitude of forms, including, for example, field notes, diaries and journals, records, biographies, autobiographies, biographies, formal records, timesheets, timetables, technical documents, minutes of meetings, samples of students' work, memos and emails, reports, and statistics reports and statistics, correspondence, plans, pamphlets, and advertisements, prospectuses and directories, archives, stories, annals and chronicles, photographs and artifacts, conversations and speeches, policy documents, primary and secondary sources, newspaper articles, uh, books and articles, public records, 
This is only an initial list and indeed one can see that no written source is ruled out in documentary analysis. For the uh, uh, written sources of data, uh, consider the original intention of the document, the reasons or causes of the documents, the intended outcomes of the documents, the interests of the writer, the original agenda of the document, and the original uh, uh, audience of the document, the status of the document, the original context of the document, the style register of the document. Uh, what are the written sources of data? Need to consider the ownership of the document. Um, that's probably the same. So this was this lecture was about uh, historical research and documents. We have explored its uh, its different forms, techniques, methods used in historical research, and how can that be useful in an educational context. And if you think that you can uh, apply this as a research method, you would have gained um, some idea about what is expected in an historical research. With that, we have, uh, we have reached towards the end of uh, today's lecture. And thank you very much for listening. Until next time. Goodbye.